Hey everyone, in University of Chemistry 1112 course, this is the first lecture for Unit 13. That is the first topic we do in Chemistry 1112, all about chemical kinetics. This will be a review for many of you. We're adding in some new concepts, but lots of the stuff you've seen in your grade 12 chem course. So that's good. And this is page 606 and onwards. And it's a large chapter, but it's an interesting one. So what will we learn in it? We will learn about what reaction mechanisms are. I'm looking at the chapter contents here. Uh, the rates of chemical reaction. Remember, rate is a change of something. Here it's going to be a change in concentration with respect to time. Just like you may get a pay rate at Sobeys, $12 an hour, uh, that's how much money you make per hour, right? So rates could be how much uh, carbon dioxide is created per day, or how much hydrogen is consumed per second. Though there's average rates, there's instantaneous rates. You really need calculus to get into this in all details, and uh, as the years go by, you'll do more of that, I hope. Uh, then in section 13.3, concentration versus uh, reaction rates. Then some experimental kinetics, all those trials and finding the orders. Then uh, linking the mechanisms with the rate laws. And we'll look at what's called the rate determining steps. We'll go into details of how temperature affects the rate. And then catalysis. So those are the main topics that we're going to look at in this uh, chapter and you can read the learning objectives yourselves ozone problem uh, gets things started so uh, I'm going to go uh, very um, orderly I hope um, with the way the textbook does it there's different approaches but this one's fine um, so uh, reaction mechanisms is the first uh, discussion and Again, there's some stuff that we talk about near the beginning of this chapter that we revisit in more detail later on. So uh, let's get going with this one here. Usually in a chemical reaction, I like to call it the target equation or the uh, overall equation, it doesn't happen in one step. It happens in a series of steps. Okay, so the target equation happens in a series of steps, and that's called the reaction mechanism. Rxn is an abbreviation for reaction. So the reaction mechanism, and there can be uh, a variety of proposed reaction mechanisms for a given uh, reaction, overall reaction, or target reactions, right? just overall and target interchangeably. Um, the uh, one that is right is the one that uh, corresponds with experimental data. Okay, so uh, here's an example of a me mechanism, the formation of dinitrogen tetroxide. So you might think that uh, it would arise from the collision of two NO2 molecules uh, with the proper orientation and enough energy, right? The activation energy, the proper orientation, to get what's called an effective collision. And maybe, maybe it does. Then it would be one reaction by molecular. Um, well, but um, I would then we're just in, uh, in the middle here an activated complex. So, uh, hmm. But this activated complex wouldn't work, would it? Because you wouldn't get the nitrogen bonding with the nitrogen. So this wouldn't be a proper approach. This would be ineffective, right? Because nitrogen's blue, oxygen's in red. So you don't want blue and red to come together. You want blue and blue to come together. And uh, we aren't even going to see that one. Oh, yeah, here we are. Here's the effective one. The collision must form a collision complex that brings the two nitrogen atoms into contact. So this orientation concept is important, right? If 
the nitrogen atom of one nitrogen strikes an oxygen of the second, it's, you aren't going to get N2O4. Okay, we still haven't gone into the details of the mechanism, but we're just doing an intro here. You have to have the right orientation for that to happen. Okay, um, then we have some vocabulary. The series of elementary steps give you the reaction mechanism. And elementary steps are usually either unimolecular, so it's one molecule that just loses energy and flies apart, bimolecular, where two creatures hit each other, and termolecular. You might think it should be called trimolecular, but it's not. Just like you can talk about primary, secondary, tertiary healthcare. Ter means three in this context. Okay, so um, a mechanism is a description of the actual molecular events that occur during a chemical reaction. Each such event is an elementary reaction. You aren't going to get four bodies hitting each other at once. That's extremely rare. Even three bodies hitting each other at once isn't so common. Mostly it's one or two uh, things hitting each other. Tickle, tickle. A typical mechanism consists of a sequence of elementary reactions, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, maybe ten. Um, overall reaction describes the starting materials and the final products with stoichiometric coefficients all around so you get balanced. It's usually not elementary because it doesn't represent the individual steps. And as I said, the most common type is bimolecular. I'm saying it now, okay? So two NO2 molecules to give you N2O4 is bimolecular. Here we have the hydroxide, OH minus. And the hydronium come together, and you get the activated complex. That's the symbol here, I use for activated complex, which then gives you H2O and H2O. So the hydrogen, which is in white here, transfers over to the OH minus. Okay. Unimolecular inter uh, reaction, a single molecule fragments into two pieces or even rearranges into a different isomer, geometric rearrangement, for example. Um, N2O4 is continually vibrating. This one molecule vibrating here around the nitrogen. And then bond stretches. And if it's got a sufficient energy, the bond breaks. When the bond breaks, the baby shall fall. Right? The bond breaks and the molecule separates into two molecules of NO2, much like a spring that breaks if it's stretched too far. So you have a bond stretching and breaking. So that is unimolecular. You, of course, have to have enough energy to make that happen. And that is what is known as our activation energy. In a termolecular reaction, three bodies have to collide at the same time. And that is doesn't happen very often. Some kids say, oh, what about like a chain reaction on an icy highway in the middle of the night? Well, that's usually a bunch of two-body interactions, right? Like a series of them. Or people say, what about if I uh, break in uh, billiards, right? The white ball hits the uh, triangle of all the other balls. But think of that triangle as just one big object. So that's actually bimolecular. So um, three things hitting each other together isn't as common. So instead of a three-body collision, usually, Sometimes they can happen, but usually they'll occur in uh, two steps. First step, you got two molecules collide. Second step, third molecule collides with the complex that was just formed. Um, so, to summarize, the mechanism of a reaction converts starting materials to products through a specific sequence of bimolecular collisions and unimolecular rearrangements, with some termolecular thrown in there. This will take us to the rate determining step and things like that. Um, now, not many reactions are as simple, we wish they were, as the NO2, uh, N2O4 equilibrium. Let's say we want some NO2 molecules to decompose into nitrogen monoxide and molecular oxygen rather than N2O4. So now there's this reaction here. 2NO2 goes to 2NO plus O2. 
you might think, well, this could happen in one step, right? NO2 and NO2 hitting each other. Well, let's see. And one of the NO bond breaks and a new OO bond forms. But there could be more than one sequence that this can happen. So let's look at some possibilities here. The first, we can have the NO2 just spitting out an oxygen. So you get NO plus O. Now you'd have to balance this uh, correct to make that happen, right? Uh, in fact, if it was balanced, I'd have to put plus N. Uh, no, 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 that's okay. That is balanced. That's balanced. That's okay. So that's one thing that happened. High temperatures collisions may tra transfer enough energy to allow some NO2 molecules to break apart. That is one of the NO bonds break to produce a molecule of NO and an oxygen atom. You see where it's tapering in here? That's showing that it's sort of pinching out and ready to break. Um, And then in the next step of the mechanism, right? So here, this is step one. And then in the second step, I don't know why they call it step one, two. That seems a little silly. The oxygen that was formed here is going to react with another molecule of NO2 to give me O2 and NO. So that is uh, one possibility that can happen. Okay, let's get 608. Uh, NO, uh, NO plus O. Okay. Um, and if I add them together, I'll get the NO2 adds together. O is what we call an intermediate. And then we got uh, NO and O2. One thing I'm going to use that I made this up myself, I call it an ARPIC chart, not armpit, but ARPIC. For reactants, products, intermediates, and catalysts. So NO2 is a reactant. We see it on the left, but not on the right. There's no other uh, reactants here. NO and O2 are the products. The intermediate is a creature that's created. You don't dump in an intermediate. It's created somewhere in the reaction mechanism, first on the right-hand side, and then later it is consumed on the left-hand side. You can have more than one intermediate. Some books call it reaction intermediate or reactive intermediate. I just like to say intermediate, so it's like between things, first on the product and the reactant. This was one of them. No catalysts in this process. We'll get to catalysts later. So this might be the reaction mechanism. A unimolecular process and then a bimolecular process. Okay, um, a second possible mechanism starts with a bimolecular reaction. Okay, so you get the NO2 and the NO2 coming together, and you get the activated complex, the most unstable collection of all the colliding particles, and then one of the oxygens is transferred from the NO2 to the other NO2 to get you an NO3 and you have an NO has the other product. Then that NO3 that was formed is going to distort and break apart into an NO and an O2. So it does a bit of a fancy dance going on there. So you have a bimolecular process first and then a unimolecular process. So in my RPIC diagram, my reactants are NO2, and my products are NO and O2, just like before. There's no catalyst. My intermediate here is NO3. So the question is, well, which one? I mean, both these reaction mechanisms give us the overall stoichiometry. Which one? is the correct one. So I'm reading through here. Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> we need more information. So uh, here's the discussion of intermediates. I already talked about it. The oxygen atom in mechanism one is an intermediate for that mechanism. The NO3 
molecules in mechanism two are um, intermediates for mechanism two. Intermediates uh, usually exist only briefly and are gobbled up. Um, okay, so we still don't know. How do we really find out? We look, can we catch a fleeting glimpse of an intermediate? Okay, it's like, can we see the wind? Can we trap a moonbeam, right? It's very poetic, isn't it? Um, and the answer is maybe you have to, some people use these, uh, some of these scientists with lots of grand money, use uh, lasers to slow things down and measure things that are like on the femtosecond le level that's like 10 it's like less than a trillionth that's a thousand trillionth yeah a thousand trillionth of a second they're able to say oh yes there was an intermediate it was oh, oh monatomic oxygen or it was nitrogen trioxide so that is the actual mechanism if oxygen we just said that if oxygen atoms are detected we know it was mechanism one if no3 is detected as mechanism two um Highly sensitive measuring techniques are therefore required. So guess what? They aren't going to tell us. You go on the Google and send me an SB note and tell me which one is the winner. Okay? That's the fun thing to do. Uh, now, uh, as we're talking about reaction mechanisms, we have the rate determining step, RDS. Rates determining step. It turns out that the uh, overall rate of reaction is proportional to the concentrations of the reactant in the rate determining step. Okay, so how fast do chemical reactions occur? The speed is described by its rates, number of events per time. Some reactions are fast, some are slower. The observed rate of overall is determined by the slowest, uh, most time-consuming steps. Okay. Um, at a busy airport, okay, so there's always analogies. I mean, I'll give you one in a sec. Busy airport, airplanes queue up and wait for the runway to become available. After a pilot receives permission, the plane becomes airborne very quickly. But no matter how quickly an airplane is loaded and ready to leave the gate, the rate of, rate of takeoff is determined by the availability of runways. So if there's just one runway, you're going to be waiting longer. Baggage claim is often the rate determining step at the end of the flight. You're all excited. Oh, yeah, we got into Toronto 20 minutes early. But then you got to wait at the baggage carousel for like two hours. And then someone else walks off with your bag, right? Um, no matter how quickly, <laughs> excuse me, I'm wearing a mask, don't worry. No matter how quickly the passenger leaps from their seats, push through the aisle and race through the terminal, passengers who check their baggage cannot leave the airport any faster than the baggage is delivered. So that's why nobody travels with baggage anymore. They just wear like 10 coats, right? Um, I like to think of a rate determining step. Like let's say, uh, you're at Sobeys and getting some ice cream and you know exactly where the ice cream is and that's all you want. And then you run, get the ice cream and go in line to pay for it. And just before you get in line, I walk in front of you, right? And it's seniors day and I'm technically a senior at some of these places. And so I start talking to the cashier and showing pictures of my grandkids and asking if the coupon for Baked beans is still valid from 1993. So I'm slowing down the process. I'm the rate determining step in the process of you getting your ice cream and going home. Meanwhile, you're behind me. You're getting pretty ticked off as all your ice cream is melting. I will assume the cashier is doing a fine job. So that's another example. You can think of other rate determining steps. So everything depends on the rate determining step. And if you get into more details about this, you can have varieties and multiples of rate determining steps, but we're going to keep it simple just with one rate determining step, RDS. Um, some students think that the first step in a uh, 
reaction mechanism is always the rate determining step. And if you think that, you are incorrect. That is not true. Many times it is, but it could be the last step. It could be an intermediate step. Uh, so eventually the rate determining step does have to be expressed in terms of measurable concentrations, things that you put in. But um, it is an elementary step. It can be any step. Monatomic oxygen atoms don't want to... Uh, uh, here's one, let's do this. Here's a three-step mechanism all by... yet do we have any no it doesn't look like it so I got 2NO plus 2 express a reaction rate. So I'm jumping all the way down. You can read that stuff if you want. But uh, by uh, convention, the rate Uh, amounts and products are gaining so okay so we're talking about reactants uh, going to products so reactants are losing uh, amounts and products are gaining so we have here a general reaction with the lowercase a, B, D, and E to refer to stoichiometric coefficients in a balanced equation. And so we can say the rate of reaction to have equivalent uh, descriptions, all you do is, well, for reactant sides, you've got to put negative sign. You divide through by the coefficient and then the change in the concentration of A with respect to T. So minus one over A, change in concentration of A with respect to T, which is minus one over B, change in concentration of B with respect to T. T, and then on the product side, 
1 over lowercase d, changing the concentration of d with respect to time, which is 1 over lowercase e, changing the concentration of e with respect to time. Okay, so uh, the lowercase letters represent the stoichiometric coefficients, and the uppercase letters represent uh, the chemical substance. Okay, um, so let's see how, this, how that works. Acrylonitrile, I... In 1988, I believe it was, I wrote a article in the Journal of Physical Chemistry about acrylonitrile, 1988. That was a few years ago, wasn't it? Acrylonitrile is produced from propene, ammonia, and oxygen in the following balanced equation. So uh, I didn't write the article by myself. I wrote it with three other guys, but anyways. Um, relate the rates of reactions of starting materials and products. Okay, so in a question like this, I don't know how fast things are, but I can relate the relative rates. Relate the relative rates, that's hard to say, of the reactants and products. So all you do, I'm gonna jump straight to the uh, answer here. Reaction rate is minus one half, change in concentration of C3H6 with time, minus one half, change in concentration of ammonia with respect to time, minus one third, change in concentration of oxygen with respect to time. On the product side, since things are being formed, I don't put the minus sign in front. So it's one half, change in the concentration of uh, acrylonitrile with respect to time, which is one sixth, change in concentration of H2O with respect to time. Which numbers you use to crunch out the final rate depend on what data you have. What's the easiest way to get data? So you have to look and decide that. Some books, by the way, and uh, some profs, they don't use the negative sign. They just use absolute value for everything. And you can use that if you want. But I'll do the same as the book with the minus signs. OK. Um, let's try practice exercise 13.1. Relate the rate of formation of N2O4 to the rate of disappearance of NO2. So the rate, first of all, the rate of the reaction would be minus one half the change in concentration of NO2 with respect to time, which would be equal one times the change in concentration of N2O4 with respect to time. So minus one half the change in concentration of NO2 with respect to time which equals the change in concentration of N2O4 with respect to time. So now it says rate of formation of N2O4 to rate of disappearance. Well, the formation of N2O4 is just that. This is the formation of N2O4. Yes, it is the rate of the whole reaction is this. And uh, the rate of disappearance of NO2. Well, right now, if I want to talk about the rate of disappearance of NO2, I would have to write it as minus the change of NO2 with respect to time, because that would show it disappearing, would be two times the change in concentration of N2O4 with respect to time, right? Multiply both sides by two. So you got to look at the words. NO2 is disappearing at twice the rate at which N2O4 is forming. Okay, that's that's what we're saying there. Okay, uh, let's just let's get the relative rates for this one. I'm not going to draw these diagrams here. I think they're sort of silly. So the rate of the reaction. This is our famous Haber process. Remember the Haber process? First World War, synthetic fertilizer, Fritz Haber. Bot guano, ships from Chile to Germany, British blowing up the ships as they went across. So rate is minus one half, change in concentration of N2 with respect to time, which is minus one third, the change in concentration of H2 with respect to time, which is one half, change in concentration of NH3 with respect to time. Okay, um, so uh, let's keep going here. What are we going to look at here?
this is just what I was talking about concentration. The more concentrated, yeah, let's just uh, concentrate. And again, the books always put this out. I'll leave this off. The concentration of the reactants. in the rate determining step okay um, yeah and the weight law may contain concentrations of chemical species that are not part of the balance over reactions you could have a rate law which has got catalyst in it and the concentration of catalyst would be important so in general the rate law is rate is k times a to the y b to the z k is known as the rate constant and the unit of the rate constant depends on the order of the reaction the order of the reaction is the sum of the uh, exponents i like to use m n's p the book here is using y z they might use the x as well it doesn't matter which one you use so each exponent is called the order of the reaction the overall order is the sum of those uh, exponents so here y is the order with respect to a and z is the order with respect to b the overall order of this reaction is y plus z uh if the value of y is one it's first order if two it's second order etc almost all of the orders we'll look at will be zero one two three or four there's one weird thing with a fraction we won't have negative orders so uh but almost always if you're calculating the order of a uh, reaction it's going to be zero one two three or four um okay yeah the exponents in a rate law depend on the reaction mechanism rather than this, on the stoichiometries now if it only happens in one step yeah then it's the same thing but the order of a reactant often differs from the stoichiometric coefficient so a rate law must always be determined by conducting experiments. You can't just look at a overall reaction and say, oh, I'm going to plug in the stoichiometric coefficients as the powers, and there you go, because I remember something about doing that last year with chemical equilibrium. This is a, not quite the same thing. Uh, you'd have to get experimental data and uh, take information from there. Um, experimental data shows that the rate law for the reaction of O3 with NO2 to give N2O5 and O2 is first order in each reactants. So even though the overall reaction is here, doing a series of experiments, a series of unfortunate events, the experimental rate is second order overall. First order with respect to NO2 and first order with respect to O3. It's not third order. It's not NO2 squared times O3. We emphasize this a lot because we always see students make this mistake, we being the chemical community. Notice that for this reaction, the order of reaction with respect to NO2 is 1, whereas the stoichiometric coefficient is 2. This shows that the order of a reaction for a particular species cannot be predicted by looking at the overall balanced equation. If a reaction does proceed in a single step, then it will mirror the stoichiometry. I mean, it is the rate determining step. If there's one step, well, yeah, that's the rate determining step. Uh, the reaction is first order in each of the starting materials when I have NO plus O3 goes to NO2 plus O2. So yeah, there, the experimental rate equals the rate law equals K times NO times O3. And then you can start looking at things and say, okay, I, if I now decide to double the concentration of NO, well, then I'll double the rate because the rate is proportional to concentration of NO. If instead I double the O3 concentration, then I double the rate as well. If I double the NO concentration and the O3 concentration, both at the same time, perhaps by uh, squeezing the gases into a container of half the initial volume, then the rate would go up four times. Okay. 
If I sell simultaneously triple the rate of NO and third the rate of O3, well, then the rate would stay the same. Okay? So uh, here we have um, relationship between mechanisms and the rate law can be illustrated by the decomposition of NO2. So uh, suppose the rate experimentally is k times NO2 squared. We might think that this would happen in one step. Well, let's see. Mechanism one um, is two steps. We have a rate determining step. It's the first step. So they're telling us that that's the rate determining step. That's slower. Yeah, because when the O reacts, it reacts quickly because it's a reactive intermediate. So the rate would be K times NO2. In the second step, sorry, in the second mechanism, they're both two steps. Second mechanism, the first step is slow, so rate is K times NO2 squared, which matches with the experimental rate. So we would have to toss out mechanism number one, and mechanism number two would be the winner. So that answers the question. You don't have to Google it anymore. Each mechanism predicts a rate behavior that can be compared with experimental rate law, but the one prediction that's differing from experimental observation is incorrect, right? Okay. Um, any step that comes after the rate determining step can't influence the overall rate of reaction. Okay. Um, Now they're just uh, just re reiterating what we just said. Okay, a uh, rate constant. Uh, it's not uh, some magical constant that um, only has one value. It's not like capital G, the universal gravitational constant. It depends on how you write the reaction, it depends on temperature. Uh, the rate constant goes up, time for reaction to happen goes down, the temperature goes up. So temperature going up causes the rate constant to go up. They're independent of concentration in time, that's why we call them rate constants. But they are sensitive to temperature. We got some exponential you know, uh, functions, E things happening when we get to there. A rate of reaction, units are concentration per time, like moles per liter per second, or else you can write it as molarity per second, or M per second. That's not molar mass. I know that's annoying. Um, the rate constant always has time in the denominator, uh, but uh, let's let's make a little chart here where I'm going to give you the rate constant units depending on the overall order of the reaction. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Units of K. Well, if it's zero order, if it's zero order, rate equals K, let's say some reactant A to the zero power, which is 1. It's never going to be 0 to the 0, okay? So K would be the same units of rate, so moles per liter per second. If it's first order, then rate equals K times A if it's first order. So K would be moles per liter per second divided by moles per liter. So it would just be per second. So that's the units of K. If it's second order, rate equals K times A squared. So K is rate molars per second divided by molars squared. So it's molars to the minus one seconds to minus one. And if it's third order, rate equals K times A cubed. So it is uh, moles, molars per second divided by molars cubed. So molars to the minus two seconds to the minus one. Okay, that's where it's memorizing actually. Uh, because I don't always have to give you the order in a question, but by giving you the units of the rate constant, that's the clue that then tells you the order of the reaction. And there's different math we'll get to in a subsequent, subsequent uh, lecture in this chapter dealing with integrated rate laws where the order of the reaction dictates what 
equations you have to use. Okay, um, so let's look here at an example. Reactions in aqueous solutions can have complex kinetics. That, that's an understatement. An example is the reaction between arsenic acid and iodide ions. Well, there you got three, five, six things smashing together at once. That's not going to happen. The weight law turns out to be third order. Um, so what are the units of the rate constant when time is expressed in minutes? Usually it's per second, but it can be minutes. So the units of the rate law for third order are molarities to the minus two seconds to the minus one, but no, they want it in minutes. So minutes to the minus one. Okay. Um, so that's all that is I'm making more detail, more detail than you have to do. Uh, what are the units of the rate constant for the reaction of hydroxide? This is practice exercise 13.3, which was seized by a single collision. Okay, so that is um, second order, right? Rate equals K. Assuming this whole thing is just one collision, so it's a second what unit wanted in. A quick way to know this is just take the opposite value. One and one is two, third order. Two and one is three, first order. One doesn't work for zero order. Okay. Um, let's try thirteen point. Three uh, point point two. Yeah, we can do both. Thirteen point three point two and thirteen point three point three. Thirteen point three point two. Uh, the rate is first order, so the rate law could be written as rate equals k times the concentration of uh, cis two butene. That's an organic molecule that can flip around and become trans 2 butene. And so that's first order, so the units of K are seconds to the minus one. Next one, you might think happen, would happen in one step. This overall reaction, H2 plus Br2 goes to 2HBr. They might think, oh, it should be second order. But look, experiments show that the reaction is first order in H2 and one half order in Br2. Really? You want, they're really going to give me a half order? Will all be, we can handle it. Rate equals K times H2 times Br2 to the one half. So the overall order is three halves. And the unit of the rate constant, well, let's get it. So K would be rates, so moles per liter per second. To the minus one half. She knows your chemistry, by the way. Seconds to the minus one half. Just a, a, a quick thing. Sometimes you'll get a question. Well, let, 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 let's say this is something maybe I should have talked before. Instead of an average rate, let's say you had some initial concentration of one molar. And then later on, let's say a minute later, it was 0.3 molar and it took 60 seconds. So I could get the rate by just looking at the change in concentration. So 0.3 minus one over 60, right? Sometimes you're just given numbers like that, not often, but sometimes. So we could take uh, 0.3 minus one and divide by 60 and we'd get on average minus 0 0.01167 uh, moles per liter of A would be converted into product every second. Okay, so that is good for the first lecture in <coughs> chemical kinetics. We may break that down and uh, then
uh, Winnipeg. lecture two is when we get into the experimental kinetics. So that'll be next time. Have fun.